Almighty God, by your great mercy, we have reached this land. The real story of America's first settlers. So they were missionaries. They weren't running away from anything. Plus, I was like, what is this? A cancer survivor sees her disease return with a vengeance. This is like not anything I've dealt with before. How she survived as our week of prayer continues. And this whole thing is a miracle. On today's 700 Club. Welcome. Act one, scene one of the unfolding drama that became the United States of America took place on this day in 1607. We're going to be talking about uh, the beginning of this great nation. But right now, up to 75 million Americans are facing the threat of severe weather today with tornadoes and severe storms pounding the country from the East Coast through the South. The brutal storms have already killed around 30 people in just two days, and it's not over yet. Heather Sells has the story. Overnight, more deadly tornadoes swept through the South. In Tupelo, Mississippi, one struck downtown. To see trees twisted and snapped like what they are now, it's nothing I've ever seen in my life, and it's nothing I ever want to see again. The hardest hit areas so far, Mississippi and Arkansas. It's where I grew up. All of these houses are my family's houses, and they're gone. Authorities say the death toll could have been worse if people had not taken shelter after listening to forecasts and getting cell phone alerts. We got alerts 20 minutes before it happened that we needed to do something, but being stubborn and bullheaded, I didn't react until five minutes before it happened. Tim Lee was huddled in his home with his family when he realized the front door was open. As he went to close it, he witnessed the powerful tornado that would carve out an 80-mile path of destruction through suburban Little Rock. You saw nothing but chaos, stuff being thrown across the yard, just wild. And I locked the door, ran back to the bathroom, and then it was like a, a roaring freight train for 20 or 30 seconds. And then after that, it was calm. A tornado also struck nearby Valonia, ripping this bell from the local Methodist church and tossing it 75 yards. A steel girder encrusted in cement that was completely ripped out of the ground and twisted. Forecasters say the violent thunderstorms and tornadoes aren't over yet. They're expected to threaten millions of lives in many central, southern, and mid-Atlantic states between now and Thursday. Heather Sells, CBN News. Thanks, Heather. Uh, terrible storms just south of us in North Carolina. We didn't mention that in that story, but down in Tupelo, uh, our command center for Operation Blessing is, is on the way to Mississippi. If it's not already there, they're setting up uh, the necessary equipment to feed people, to help rebuild houses, to take uh, branches and limbs out of the way, and to bring some kind of normalcy back to those people. Terrible, absolutely terrible what's happening. It's amazing. We just had a story in the news that said the start of tornado season has been relatively benign, and then bang, it hit right across the country in very, very severe weather. Well, in other news, Secretary of State John Kerry is trying to calm a political storm that he created himself. John Jessup has that story from Washington. Here's John. Pat, Secretary of State Kerry is backing off his remarks about Israel, saying it could become a potential apartheid state if it doesn't reach a peace deal with the Palestinians. Both Republicans and Democrats, along with Jewish leaders, blasted Kerry, pointing out the rights that Palestinians have in Israel compared to the treatment of blacks under apartheid in South Africa. Kerry's remarks were first reported by the Daily Beast website. Although Kerry says he chose the wrong word, he did not apologize for the comment and says he's committed to Israel. 683 people have been sentenced to death in Egypt's latest mass trial against supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood. Among those sentenced is Mohammed Badi, the Brotherhood's spiritual guide. The trials have drawn international condemnation. Human rights groups say there's no way the defendants are getting a fair trial. However, the same judge also reduced most of the death sentences of 529 defendants in a similar case in March, sentencing the majority of them to life imprisonment. The same court will hold another session on June 21st to issue the final verdicts. A possible link between high doses of antidepressants 
and suicidal behavior in young people when those high doses are given early in treatment. That's the finding from a new study published in the Journal of American Medical Association. Teens and young adults who started their treatment with higher than recommended doses were twice as likely to have suicidal thoughts or try to hurt themselves, especially in the first three months. You can find out more about this study by going to CBNNews.com. Well, Wednesday marks an historic day in American history, the anniversary of the first time an American president took the oath of office. And an event honoring George Washington is also bringing together big names in politics and the evangelical community and a national celebration of prayer. Since our founding in 1776, the United States has only known 44 presidents, from Barack Obama to George Washington. And arguably, few have had a more lasting impact than the country's first, a Revolutionary War hero who served as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army and a man who's revered as the father of the nation. All over the capital, George Washington's legacy is apparent in monuments and statues, the city's even his namesake. But for the organizer of an upcoming event honoring the country's first president, Washington was more than a founding father. He set many precedents, none more important, he says, than a public profession of faith and a divine God. After being sworn in there at Federal Hall, he placed his hand upon an open Bible and he pledged an oath before God and the nation to uphold the Constitution. George Washington, immediately after he took the oath of office under the Constitution, leaned down, picked up his Bible, and kissed the Bible. From there, he invited his vice president, his cabinet, to follow him. They walked down the street to St. Paul's Chapel, where they had divine services, and there in that service, America was dedicated to God. This year marks the 225th anniversary of Washington's first inauguration, which will be commemorated by a prayer event in the U.S. Capitol. Minnesota Congresswoman Michelle Bachman is this year's congressional host. It's an overlooked day, but we are not going to overlook it. This is a seminal moment, and we as members of Congress are inviting the nation for, to come back and remember this very great man, more importantly, what he did. He dedicated our nation to the glory of God. Now in its third year, Washington, a man of prayer, brings together members of the House and Senate to pray for the nation and its leaders. CBN News interviewed the event's founder at Washington's historic Mount Vernon home. And it is our hopes and desires that having this event, Washington, a man of prayer, on May 7th, will bring attention to the fact that not only was our nation founded upon the principles of God's Word, but it was also a moment for all men around the world because for the last 225 years, men from all nations, all creeds, all colors have desired to come to America. The event, emceed by former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee, is only for members of Congress. But this year, the prayer will be beamed into homes and churches on the Daystar Television Network. It will also be available on a live webcast, inviting Americans to join with the prayers of their leaders for America to return to its Christian heritage. 700 million homes have access to their viewers viewing, and we are just trusting God that he will allow the world to see members of the Senate, members of the House, noted Christian leaders, acknowledge George Washington as a man of faith, a man of prayer. And you can watch Washington, A Man of Prayer. It will air next Wednesday, May 7th, from 8.30 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time on the Daystar Television Network. And you can see it online at CBN.com. Pat, Washington had a lasting legacy. Well, he did indeed, and uh, he picked off the day that we're celebrating today, which is the 29th. Uh, and we're going to talk about that. This is the day that this country was founded, and it, it took place um, if Washington was inaugurated in uh, 1789 or whatever it was, this took place in 1607, so it's a whole lot earlier, and that's when the, the nation started, and we're going to talk about that. Terry. Remarkable story, and up yeah. next we have the story of the birth of our nation. It's one you won't find in textbooks. We've been all taught in America that the pilgrims came to America for religious freedom or religious liberty, but that's really a shallow understanding of why they came. They weren't running away from anything. You'll hear the real story of the first landing when we come back. What can that be? 
52 year old male complaining of chest pain. Clear. Heart attacks can happen at any time. My name is Dr. Crandall, and as a cardiologist, I tell my patients that they need to be aware of the hidden symptoms of a heart attack. Here's the truth. If you suffer cardiac arrest outside of a hospital, you have just a 7% chance of surviving. That is why I've created the Simple Heart Test to help you determine your own risk of heart disease. Go online today and in just two minutes, you'll discover your risk of suffering a heart attack, how you score on my heart disease risk factor scale, plus the key warning signs your heart is in trouble. Over two million Americans have already taken my Simple Heart Test and I urge you to do so now before it's too late. Take your free online heart test today and discover how to get Dr. Crandall's bestseller, The Simple Heart Cure. Go to simpleharttest.com today. Tomorrow. She had caretakers around the clock. The next step was to put me in a nursing home. Seizures ravaged her body. Her body would, you know, shake and quiver. And they ravaged her mind. This is what's going to happen. How dare you put so much hope in my life? Our week of prayer continues. My friend said, God's got this. Don't worry about it. He's got this. Tomorrow on The 700 Club. Well, it was a momentous day. A plaque was set up by the Interior Department at the site, and it, the plaque said, they've taken it down now. They always take good stuff down, but it was put up there. It said, Act One, Scene One of the unfolding drama that became the United States of America. But on April the 29th, this day, 1607, English settlers came ashore at a place called Cape Henry here in Virginia Beach. Of course, it wasn't called Virginia Beach then either, but this was Cape Henry after Henry, the son of the British monarch. And these pioneers planted a cross on the shore and claimed the land, in their words, for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look back now at that historic day and see why it's so important for you and me now. April 29, 1607, a nation was born. Travel-weary Englishmen landed at Cape Henry on the shores of Virginia and lay the foundation for what would become the most powerful country the world has ever seen. Act One, Scene One of the drama that was to be the United States unfolded that day at Cape Henry and sparked the legacy of godliness on American shores. Almighty God, by your great mercy, we have reached this land, which we now claim and establish for thy eternal purposes. We ask thee to open hearts and enlighten the understanding of the peoples of these shores to comprehend the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. America's destiny and purpose were sealed with that cross at Cape Henry. All that would follow in our nation's growth hinged on that single proclamation that this land belonged to Jesus Christ. In the Mayflower Compact of 1620, the Pilgrims reaffirmed the mission set forth by the original Virginia settlers. For generations, uh, we've been all taught in America that the Pilgrims came to America for religious freedom or religious liberty, but that's really a shallow understanding of why they came. William Bradford, their great chronicler and governor, himself put it like this. He said, they had a great hope and an inward zeal of advancing the cause of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the earth, yea, even though they should be but as stepping stones unto others for the performing of so great a work, close quote. So they were missionaries. They weren't running away from anything. Later, the Puritans carried the Cape Henry legacy further on the deck of the Arbella, halfway between England and Cape Cod, leader John Winthrop declared, we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. When Winthrop wrote in the model of Christian charity toward the end that we shall be as a city upon a hill. It comes from the Sermon on the Mount. What Winthrop is thinking is that everybody's gonna be watching 
this experiment in self-government that is about to take place here in North America in 1630, and that the importance of this experiment in putting biblical principles into practice and thereby creating a just society is that it would serve as an example and an encouragement to the rest of the world. We ask now that your kingdom come to earth and your will be done as it is in heaven. And to that end, we claim this land for that great purpose. Amen. Amen. More than a hundred years later, as America set off on her own course towards independence, the godly foundations laid in Virginia established the character of our revolution. John Adams boldly proclaimed, Before God, I believe the hour has come. My judgment approves this measure, and my whole heart is in it. All that I have, all that I am, and all that I hope in this life, I am now ready to stake upon it. And I leave off as I began, that live or die, survive or perish, I am for the declaration. It is my living sentiment, and by the blessing of God, it shall be my dying sentiment. Independence now, and independence forever. George Washington's pure Christian heart, Benjamin Franklin's call to prayer, and John Adams' reverence for the will of God symbolize the undying commitment of our founding fathers to the creation of a nation which would glorify God. The American character was born in Scripture and nurtured by the Holy Spirit, and yet today our national heritage is under siege. The moment that religion, the pure undefiled religion, loses its influence over our hearts, from that fatal moment, farewell to public and private happiness, Farewell, a long farewell, to virtue, to patriotism, to liberty. Bishop James Madison, 1795. More than 400 years have passed since America was first conceived at Cape Henry, and respect for our roots is growing cold. Yet one undeniable fact still remains. At its core, the United States of America is a Christian nation. Well, folks, we celebrate this day, April the 29th, 1607, was the date of the f true founding of America. We have, of course, the Declaration of Independence, the an adoption of our Constitution, all important days. But today, we celebrate a prayer mm -hmm. that took place well over 400 years ago. Terry and I are going to join, and I ask you to join with us that we might pray for this nation in this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for the godly heritage. We thank you for that brave band of men and women who first stepped ashore at Cape Henry on April the 29th, 1607. We thank you, Lord, for the prayer that has gone up over the years of men and women who've been willing to sacrifice their lives and their sacred honor to establish a great nation. And we're here enjoying the fruits of their sacrifice and of their prayers. And we ask, Lord, that we might give to our children and grandchildren the same great nation and the same heritage. Fill us, Lord, with your presence. And may the anointing of the Holy Spirit come once again upon this land, that it might be a land of your planting to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for mm -hmm. this day. Amen. Amen. And amen. Mm -hmm. well, we'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Still ahead. Yes, it is malignant, and it's, it's stuck to your heart. A mother battles cancer. I am not dying six separate times. It was just really like shocking. I've never seen anything like that. And survives through the power of prayer. My liver surgeon comes busting through and said, the resurrection. At 69, I'm starting a whole new chapter in my life. Lifestyle Lift, a life-changing procedure that helps remove wrinkles, frown lines, and sagging skin on your face and neck. I have a younger look and a new look on life. 
Look, almost 200,000 lives changed. Lifestyle Lift is the affordable way to looking years younger. Nothing's better than a Lifestyle Lift. Don't miss your chance for your free skin firming treatment. Call now because this amazing offer ends soon. Every time I see somebody, you look so good, you just never age. I go, oh, thank you for that. You know? Would you feel good looking younger and more attractive? I haven't felt this good in years. My name is Cindy, I'm 56, but nobody needs to know. Don't miss your chance for your free skin firming treatment. Call now because this amazing offer ends soon. Call now, 800-493-3762. Don't regret looking older than you feel. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. The Nigerian government is promising to find the nearly 200 girls reportedly abducted by the Muslim terrorist group Boko Haram. The group hasn't taken responsibility, but most blame Boko Haram for kidnapping about 230 teens from a school located in Borno State. Around 40 girls managed to escape. A group of security chiefs, state governors, and religious leaders recently met to discuss how to find the others. The Nigerian president calls it the most pressing security issue facing his country. The post of U.S. Ambassador for International Religious Freedom is still empty six months after Dr. Suzanne Johnson Cook resigned. President Obama said he's looking forward to nominating a replacement, but that was back in February. A State Department spokeswoman recently said she's had no update on a replacement. She added the vacancy does not reflect a lack of concern by the administration for religious freedom around the world. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Hey, I'm Ryan and I make people sound great. Quiet. Okay. It looked like what people hit. A lot of times I add sound effects to video to make it really come alive. You need a dog bark? I got it. You need some horn beeps? I got it. I add music to stories to set the mood. How was that? For drama. In television, audio is very important, especially when you're spreading the message of Jesus Christ. And I want to make sure people hear that message clearly. I'm an audio engineer, and I work at CBN. Hello friends, Wink Martindale here for 1-800-MEDIGAP, America's trusted source for Medicare supplemental insurance. You know, it's fun to take chances if you're on a game show, but in the real world, if you're turning 65 or already have Medicare Part A and Part B, call 1-800-MEDIGAP. My friends at 1-800-MEDIGAP can help protect you and save you money on Medicare supplemental insurance. Don't take a chance. Tell them Wink sent you when you call 1-800-MEDIGAP today. So with Vonage, you get unlimited calling to over 60 countries from this phone and from this phone. On my home phone and my mobile phone. One calling plan, two phones. Go to Vonage.com and get one calling plan for both of your phones. That's crazy. Crazy generous. Tomorrow. She had caretakers around the clock. The next step was to put me in a nursing home. Seizures ravaged her body. Her body would you know, shake and quiver. And they ravaged her mind. This is what's gonna happen. How dare you put so much hope in my life. Our week of prayer continues. My friend said, God's got this. Don't worry about it. He's got this. Tomorrow on The 700 Club. Here, we're committed to a heritage of rigorous scholarship dating back over a thousand years. And to a faith tradition dating back a thousand more. This is how we create a culture of inquiry where no topic is off limits. And a culture of hope. Where anything's possible! It's the freedom to think for ourselves. And a responsibility to act on behalf of others. It's Christian leadership. Yes, it's time we ask Cambiando el mundo. And it's changing the world for the better. It's higher learning. It's greater knowing. It's what makes us whole. It's what makes us Regent. Well, let's 
coming Saturday, Regent is going to have its graduation, and it's the largest graduating class in the history of the school. There will be about 1,439 wow. uh, graduates. And the online program is growing dramatically, and the theme is of, uh, find your place, fi find your destiny, and uh, there's something here for you. So the online program is very strong. If you want to continue your education from your home, we've got one of the finest. The region has one of the top ten online programs in America, and it's very, very good. So uh, you can call. Uh, the number's on your screen, or you can log in um, at regent.edu and ask about the online program. And Regent Online is very exciting. And, you know, people in their 30s and 40s, they say, if I just could get a college degree, I would be positioned for a promotion and a new uh, initiative in, in the work I'm doing. So it's easy to do. You can do it from home. and. Uh, outstanding faculty. So there it is. You know, why wait? Just sign up or they can call in and get all the information you need. All right, Terry. Well, yesterday we kicked off our spring week of prayer and we gathered at noon in the Regent University Chapel to pray for the requests that you have sent in to us. Our featured speaker was Keith Kraft. He's the pastor of Elevate Life Church in Frisco, Texas. Take a look. By 1984, through genome science, we discovered that 99% of our DNA sequence is the same. Red, yellow, black, or white, no matter if you're born in Africa, no matter what time in history that you've ever been born, if you are a humanoid, 99% of your DNA is all the same. There's only a 1% difference between everybody that ever has been born and everybody that ever will be born. That 1% difference that's in each one of us because we are God's sons and are God's daughters. How many of you believe you are a son and daughter of God? Because we are God's sons and we are God's daughters. That one unique percent difference that you have that nobody else has, I believe is a deposit of God's glory that is unique to you that the world has never seen, that that's your imprint of God. I don't know where you are in your life right now, what's going on, but you have a fingerprint that nobody else has to leave an imprint that nobody else can leave. It's the glory of God in you. And I just came here today to remind you of that. Let's lift these to the Lord and just ask for, for miracles. Lord, we just come to you and you came to set the captives free. And so we come into agreement for these prayer requests. So we pray for these lost sheep that they would be found and found in you. Lord, do it, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. It was a wonderful time of prayer, and it's not too late to get your prayer requests to us. You saw Gordon holding up those that he was praying for. Each one of us, each day, have a packet uh, of individual prayer requests that we read over, that we pray for. All you have to do to send yours in is call the number that's on your screen right there. It's 1-800-759-0700, or you can always log on to CBN.com, because today at noon, we're going to be streaming our prayer meeting live on CBN.com. Pat's going to be mm -hmm. our featured speaker. We don't want you to miss that. But before we talk more about it, right now I want to introduce you to a woman named Mary Pappas. She's experienced the healing power of prayer firsthand. It's been her go-to weapon in her battle against cancer six separate times. Her amazing survival is nothing short of what her doctor calls miraculous. This surgery from here to here, I'm cut open where my breastbone was sawed open. Her scars tell a story of a journey of trusting God. And they took a tumor out. And how prayer gave her the will to live. Mary Pappas is a six-time cancer survivor and is grateful to be alive. Just two years after she and her husband Steve married, she was diagnosed with stage three thymoma, a rare cancer of the thymus gland. She was only 25. She and Steve remember when doctors gave them the diagnosis. Yes, it is malignant, and it's, it's stuck to your heart, it's stuck to this, it's stuck to that. It came out of its capsule, so those cells spilled into your chest cavity. 
I did think, oh, am I going to be left alone already? This is what I prayed for. I prayed for someone to spend the rest of my life with, and this is how it's going to end up. Doctors had to perform open chest surgery. Meanwhile, Mary's family and friends from her church had come to pray. Later, I heard about prayer meetings where women and, and people were just weeping and moaning and, and crying out to God. Doctors removed the tumor successfully. Mary went through five weeks of radiation treatments and was given a clean bill of health. But over the next several years, Mary would go through two more bouts of cancer. Medical treatment and prayer helped to pull her through. I read everything possible. Everything I could read about healing, everything I could read about faith, anything I could find, I read it over and over and over. During this time, they also started a family. In 1989, they had twin boys, Stephen and Michael. For the next seven years, Mary enjoyed being a mother and living cancer-free. I just thought that that was my last episode of, of ever having cancer again, and this was all behind me, and I'm just gonna raise and adore my children. I had a lot of hope that this would be maybe the final time. But it wasn't. In 2003, a routine CAT scan showed a small mass on her liver. I was 34, I have two little kids I love more than life itself. I am not dying. Mary was admitted to the University of Pittsburgh Liver Cancer Center. Dr. James Marsh was the head surgeon. When he opened her up, he discovered a prosthetic from her previous surgery had attached to her liver. Taking out the cancer in and of itself wasn't that difficult, but getting the liver off this prosthetic material uh, was a disaster and a nightmare. And when we were doing that, her liver cracked open. So we had to take out much more of her liver than we had originally intended. Doctors removed the cancer, but after the surgery, she started having seizures. Doctors induced a coma. Her condition worsened and they put her on life support. She had scans of her brain. She had spinal taps several times. We consulted neurology, we consulted everyone, and we couldn't find what was wrong with her. For two weeks, Mary remained in the coma. Stephen and Michael were teenagers when they saw their mother in the hospital. She just had like these, like the feeding tube in there, and then she had like you know, just all these like wires attached to her, and like it was, it was just really like shocking. I've never seen anything like that. I remember walking back to the waiting room, and there were, you know, friends and family and people that are there for support. And a lot of people just had just tears in their eyes or their, their heads were down. Steve visited her every day. On one of those days, the doctor told Steve that his wife might not make it. He said, I don't think you should leave tonight. I said, that's fine, I won't. And I could tell in his voice and the way he approached me that he was, it was um, getting a little emotional. How do I explain that to my kids? Their church held a special prayer service. Their pastor, David Thomas of Victory Christian Center in Youngstown, Ohio, stood in for Mary. People laid hands upon me and a roar, whew, a roar went up of just intensity. We spoke life and decreed life. Two weeks later, Mary woke up. My liver surgeon comes busting through and said, the resurrection is what he said because, you know, I was on complete life support. I just kind of felt like it was like the Lazarus story, you know, like just come out of the tomb, you know what I mean? And just right from the come dead. forth, you know? And I was just like, she turned, I remember she turned to me and she said, praise God. And I said, yeah. I said, yeah, praise God. Mary started rehab to learn how to walk again. In one month, she was able to go home to be with her family. We're all together, and God had brought us through a phenomenal um, time, and it left a, just an imprint on our hearts. Mary beat cancer two more times in 2008 and in 2009. Since then, she's been cancer-free. She's an amazing patient. Uh, and I think her faith and her courage, probably the most outstanding thing. Yes, I would definitely call her recovery miraculous. Mary now helps other cancer patients battle cancer. 
Mary has written a book about her journey of healing and shares her testimony at women's conferences. She and her family know prayer and faith in God are the keys to overcoming any obstacle in life. We've learned about the character of God through this, and this whole thing is a miracle. I believe and I know that God will reach down into your situation and will make Himself so real and so known that you will know for sure He is in control. Mary's book was called Courage. Boy, oh, that is appropriately amazing, named, amazing. isn't it? That sometimes you endure through these things imagine, to the finish, you know? Those two teenage boys, though, helping their mother suffer this and seeing her that way and not oh, knowing my. what to do. Hey, look, it's time to pray. We have some prayer requests. We have thousands of prayer requests that have come in, about 80,000, I think, so far. It's really a huge number. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> we have 57-year-old who's got Alzheimer's. They need prayer. Uh, the Lord would send a needed finances to repair our home. And we want to pray for those people in Mississippi and in Arkansas and down yeah. in North Carolina and all up down the south that have been devastated by these terrible, terrible hurricanes, excuse me, tornadoes. And uh, somebody said uh, to keep our troops overseas safe and out of harm's way, certainly yeah. that'd be a prayer in the heart of a wife or a mother. Or, uh, and that our children and grandkids once again believe in God and return mm. to church. Wow, yeah. appropriate day for that. Yeah. Huh? There's asking for prayer for a nephew in the hospital who needs a miracle, has severe injuries from an accident. Someone else saying, I need healing of nerves and my legs damaged when I was robbed and almost killed. Uh, someone asking for a son to be able to, to secure a good job. And someone else saying, a successful hernia surgery and deliverance from the fear of having it. So lots of physical needs as well as jobs and finances. The Bible says finances. where two of you agree on earth is touching anything that they'll ask, it'll be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. Now Terry and I are yeah. going to join together and we have before us uh, well, a thousand or so prayer requests. These are just uh, representatives of the ones that come in because there's so many. And we, we're going to pray for them, for you as you cried out to God. The Lord hears, the Lord answers. Now we're going to join hands and we're going to believe God. You pray with us. What's your need right now? Father, we thank you for this testimony of healing of cancer. We thank you of many testimonies we've had of people who've been set free from bondage, who have been delivered from terrible accidents in automobiles. We thank you, Lord, for those who've been brought back from the brink. And Lord, right now, they're in this audience, people who are crying out to you in the name of Jesus. Let the power of God come into their lives. In Jesus' name, receive this throat cancer. Somebody mm -hmm. has throat cancer right now. God has just healed you. You'll feel a burning in your throat, and God's just healed you. Terry. Someone, you have a bad cut on your finger. I mean, a serious cut. Um, it was an accident. God is healing that for you right now. Migraine headaches are being healed. A migraine. Put your hand on your forehead in the name of Jesus. Touch. Someone with a hernia, that hernia is being healed now in Jesus' name. Night sweats, got a, some kind of a fungus that's, uh, you may have gotten in some tropical country. Uh, the Lord has just set you free from that. You are healed in Jesus' name. Someone else, you have a rash on the bottom of your feet. It's, <laughs> it's both sore and it, it itches at the same time. God is completely healing that rawness that's going to go away. You'll not have it again. Many in this audience, you're gripped by fear. Your fear of what's going on in the Ukraine. Your fear of the stock market. You're afraid of the economic situation. You're afraid of your life. You're in fear. In the name of Jesus, we bind a spirit of fear and cast it out of you. In Jesus' name, be set free. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. One more. Someone else that you have a terrible fear of flying and it really hampers your life and what you can yes. do. God is setting you free from that right now. And may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ come into your life and into your heart from this moment on. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Wherever you are, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to get your prayer requests and, and we certainly enjoy receiving answers to prayer and there are thousands of them coming in as mm -hmm. well. So. Uh, but uh, again, you'll be filling out these requests and we'll be taking them all week long. 
uh, and each individual we pass out among our staff at these prayer meetings and, and uh, pray for them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, up next, we've got your email questions. Dana says, is it true that we only have to ask Jesus to save us once? I heard that we have to keep asking. I need to know. That answer is coming up when we bring it on. Hi, I'm Terry Mewson. At CBN, we're here to pray for you all year long. But each spring, the entire staff of CBN sets aside a special week of prayer to intercede for your needs. Spring is the time of new beginnings, so please send us your requests, no matter how big or small, so we can pray for you. Call us now or mail your prayer request today. It's our privilege to pray for you. I was having some pains between my shoulder blades. At that point, everything changed. Diagnosis, pancreatic cancer. First, there was prayer. The second is to fight. As soon as we walked through those doors at Cancer Treatment Centers of America, all my anxiety left. The pastoral care here is based on the Bible, based on the Word of God, just as it is at our own church. When you combine the great medicine with the spiritual resources we have, it provides the patients with something that really can make a difference. You got a pastor right there on staff praying with patients, whether it be scripture or whether it just be a word of encouragement to say God's got this. If you or someone you love is fighting complex or advanced stage cancer, go to cancercenter.com forward slash faith. You'll learn how our treatment results compare to national averages and see a list of insurance plans with which we've worked. Advanced medicine and technology, the warm embrace of the spirit. I firmly believe God led me here. Call or go to cancercenter.com. Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Care that never quits. Appointments available now. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. All right. Time to answer some of your email questions as we bring it on today. Pat, this first one is from Dana who says, is it true that we only have to ask Jesus to save us once? I heard that we must continue praying the salvation prayer many times to stay saved. I'm a Christian and with the end times drawing near, I need to know. Um, you were married to a guy named Andy mm -hmm. and you said vows. How many times did you have to do it? Just once. And that got you married, didn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. You didn't have to keep saying it. It's kind of it. like Fiddler on the Roof. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> Not just kidding. On the one hand, on the other. <laughs> Love you, Andy. <laughs> but seriously, the moment you commit yourself to Jesus, you have done it. Yeah. But if you didn't really mean it, then of course you need to do it. Now, in, in terms of certain things, if you haven't had an answer to prayer, the Bible says, keep on asking, keep on seeking until you get an answer. The Lord may say no, and at that time, stop. If He, he may say, I've answered you, and at that time, start praising Him. But uh, as far as coming to the Lord, if you have in your heart uh, repented of sin, turned away from sin, turned to Jesus, been born again, how many times do you have to get born? You only get born once. Okay, this is born again. What's next? This is Jerry who says, if I continue to take my pain pills, will I still go to heaven? God says, trust him when you're sick, not medication. <laughs> you know, Jerry, uh, I took a couple of a leave today because I've got sore knees. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they kept me out of heaven, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've never. <laughs> yeah, the, cur heard the curse that. of the aspirin. There's nothing wrong with taking some pills if it if it'll alleviate pain and and suffering. And I believe in prayer. I believe in the anointing of the Lord. Now I've seen miracles and all the rest of it. So, I mean, we've seen thousands and thousands of people healed. But you don't go to heaven on the fact of whether or not you take medicine. All right. This is Joseph who says Jesus was sin free. According to the Bible, Jesus drank wine. Mom says it was probably not alcoholic wine. What do you think? You know, I hate to criticize your mother. She's probably <laughs> a wonderful, godly woman. But the truth is, wine is wine. And it was the best wine. <laughs> uh, it was, well, at the wedding, at it the was wedding, the best wine. The best wine. <laughs> you don't talk that way about grape juice. Well, you saved the best <laughs> grape juice for last. I mean, no way. He drank wine, yeah. And they call. He said they called me a wine bibber. Uh, you know, it was wine. But a, a little wine is not a sin. Uh, you know, wine that gladdens the heart of man. It's in the Bible. So Jesus wasn't sinning when he had wine. 
And, uh, but you see, uh, John came. He didn't drink wine, didn't do any of those things. And they said, he's got a demon. <laughs> Jesus said, he's a companion of wine, bibbers, and prostitutes. And he said, wisdom is justified by her children. Look at the, what he did. He was anointed man of God. He was God's perfect man, and he wasn't sinning. That wasn't sin, all right? This is Sheila who says, I think what you do for so many around the world is great. However, I'd like to know if you help people in the United States. We have a lot of situations right here at home, and it seems like everyone wants to give help outside of our country. Doesn't charity start at home? Uh, <clears throat> Operation Blessing began at home. I, I, I guess we've, you know, they say about advertising, you've got to do it about eight or nine times before people get the message. We spend about a hundred million dollars, no, excuse me, not a hundred million, but a hundred uh, million pounds of food and medicine yes. and supplies. We bring into the inner cities of America, Appalachia and the poor people every single year. And uh, uh, we have a fleet of trucks that, that picks up produce, takes produce out to the inner cities. We have farms, we have medical clinics, we have, and in terms of tornadoes and hurricanes, we're there with our Operation Blessing teams. I mean, yes, we believe in helping the United States. We help the world, that's what we're there for. Okay, this is Marie who says, I'd like to know what the Bible's telling us about the Sabbath in regards to thou shalt do no work. If we go out to eat, we're not working, but someone is on our behalf. The same goes for travel or the many other services that we seek. Well, first of all, uh, the, uh, the command, Jesus said uh, the, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The whole idea is we need a day of rest. We need a time of rest. And what's happening in our society is we've got everything going slam bang seven days a week yeah. and it's killing people. Uh, we need a day off and we, we've got to have it. We have to have a time of rest. And uh, that's what it was, it's all about. But yes, people, you go out to eat and people are cooking, but hopefully they, they've got another day, they get a couple of days off. But if they're working at an organization that has no days off, they're gonna kill themselves and they'll ruin their people and they'll be breaking some law. But the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. All right. Okay, here's our question from a viewer who says, I know in the Bible, Jesus says that you cannot see the kingdom of God without being born of water and of the spirit. What exactly does that mean? Well, he basically said, you need to be born again. You have to have a spiritual rebirth. Now, whether born of water means baptism or whether, you know, a woman mm -hmm. has so-called her waters break and mm -hmm. at birth, uh, is that the birth he's talking about? If that was the birth in water and then again being born of the Spirit, uh, it's, it's not as clear as you'd like it to be, but basically what he's saying is unless you are transformed by the Spirit of God and your spirit is renewed, you're not going to be able to see the kingdom. You're not going to be able to know the kingdom. You're not going to be able to perceive the kingdom. There's got to be a state of being born again. And the best way about being born again is that God has forgiven you and you've forgiven others. Yeah, you know, and you pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And so it's that attitude of I'm walking in forgiveness and I am in the process forgiving others. That's all we have for today, but thank, thank you. you. Great, thank great you. job. I hope so. We all enjoy right. getting your questions too. We thank you. Well, coming up, do you know how to set boundaries in your personal relationships or how about in your workplace? You're about to find out. Dr. Henry Cloud, the author of Boundaries, joins us right after this. Some of the rewards of being a parent in an online school is you are right there when the, the student makes a discovery, when they have that aha moment. Want to be more involved in your child's education? With online school programs powered by K-12, you can. Call or click now for your free information kit. K-12 has an award-winning curriculum supported by state-certified teachers designed to help parents be an active participant. I'm like the conductor of the train. I get things organized and set and then the kids uh, take over from there. K-12 is a public school option, so it's tuition free. All materials are included, and it's individualized to fit your child's unique abilities and goals. 
it's a commitment and it, it's, it's something that you, know, you have to embrace if you think that that's the best learning environment for them. 94% of K-12 parents say their student has benefited academically. Call or visit k12.com today for your free information kit. Parents are advocates for their students. They want to do what's best. You just need to be a mom that loves their child. If you've ever been in an unhealthy relationship, it's probably because you didn't know how to set boundaries. Dr. Henry Cloud literally wrote the book on the subject, and he's also extended his expertise on boundaries into the workplace. There are leaders at work, at home, and at play. One thing is sure, no matter how great the vision, a leader can only get things done with and through the people they lead. Dr. Henry Cloud is a clinical psychologist and best-selling author. He says that as a leader, sometimes you get results, and sometimes you don't. In his book, Boundaries for Leaders, Dr. Cloud shares how his seven leadership boundaries work, so you can create the kind of place where people can and will be their best. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Dr. Henry Cloud. It's great to have you back with us. It's always good to be here. For people who might not have read the initial writings that you did on boundaries, talk a little bit about what boundaries are. How do you define them? Well, basically a boundary is a property line. You know, if you think of your yard, it's got a property Absolutely. line around it. And, and we are designed to have control of our own property. That's called self-control, but we don't like that. We like to reach <laughs> over the fence and try to control everybody else. And likewise, other people's behavior sometimes end up falling into our yard and affecting us. And so yeah. boundaries are really about trying to order relationships mm -hmm. so everybody's in control of, of themselves and not each other. Yeah. And it affects every single area of our lives, doesn't it? Every area. Yeah. I mean, it, I wrote a book called Boundaries for leaders and and people say well who are the leaders and yes. I said well you know it could be mom trying to get the kids ready for school <laughs> to get in the van by eight yes. o'clock or it yes. could be somebody who's leading a global enterprise there are principles of boundaries that apply whenever we interact with people well this is your latest the boundary for leaders talk a little bit about what benefit there is to leaders in setting boundaries and likewise what problems there are if we don't well, you know, it's interesting. Leadership can go on sort of two ends of things. You know, mm -hmm. people can can kind of abdicate leadership and think yeah. everybody's got to go do the work or they can get in your face and be, yeah. you know, controlling everything. It's fine lines and, sometimes. And <laughs> exactly. And and here's what we know. You know, if, if all leaders, whether you're leading kids or a department or a team or a company, mm -hmm. If, if all leaders are basically trying to do the same thing, you know, you got a vision, you engage talent, you execute on a strategy, you hold people accountable, and you try to get a result. If everybody's doing the same thing, why do some leaders get results and others don't? Yeah. And when we study that, what we find is a lot of it is because some leaders are leading people in ways that the people's brains can actually follow them, yeah. and other leaders are not. And they're, they're they're confusing the people in their leadership and they're demoralizing them and a bunch of other factors. So how do you deal with that as, <clears throat> as a leader, whether you are a mom in the home or a CEO in the, the marketplace? Yeah. Because the people who work for you all come to you with different receptors. You know, they right. hear differently, they function differently, they're motivated by different things. How do you... Right. And, and there, there are certainly individual differences, but there are some universals that you can bank on. And, and, and what I talk about that, you know, in everything you lead. Everybody wants something that will, that, that will anchor us, <laughs> yes. right? Well, the first one is the brain needs to know what to attend to, what to not attend to, and you got to keep that in front of people all the time. So clear direction. The great leaders give the boundaries a very clear direction, and they don't confuse their people with a new main thing every mm. day. Secondly, <laughs> interestingly enough, what we know about the brain is the high-performance brain, the chemicals that actually drive it, only fire in a positive emotional environment. And leaders that use anger and, and threat and control of all that, they're, they're actually deactivating the thinking brain and they're activating what's called the fight or flight brain, which causes people to resist them or to want to go away. Yeah. So that's two examples. A third one would be, you'd start to... Well, no, I, w I was just going to say that's so, you know, I, I'm just thinking as a mom with children, how oh, every yeah. child so unique. I mean, you really need to know your people. You do need to know your people. And that would be a third one is that that connected leaders are the leaders that that people actually follow. 
And when we talk about connection, it's not just being in somebody's face. It's really able, and this is what great leaders do, Mm -hmm. they get out of their own skin and try to understand the reality of what the people they're leading is really like, yeah. you know, what's it like to follow them? What's their work day like? What's the marketplace like? What is the strategy like for them? Mm-hmm. Because if you're trying to impose something and not knowing the reality of the people you're trying to impose it upon, it's not going to work. So talk a little bit about this statement you make that, that good leaders need to be, quote, ridiculously in charge. Ridiculously in charge. How do you do that without being in someone's face or pressuring them? I mean, that would be your initial interpretation right. of that, but that's but you talk about it. Right. If, if, if everybody could kind of get yeah. this one sentence in their head, what you're finding in your family or your organization or your teams is basically what you're either you are creating or you're allowing. Mm. Okay, if you're in charge, doesn't mean you have to control and micromanage everybody, but if you're in charge, the culture you're getting, the results you're getting, you're either creating that mess or you may not be creating it, but you're allowing Allowing it. it. So for leaders to be ridiculously in charge basically means as a leader, you got to own it and say, look, you know, I am the one that's been put in charge of this. It doesn't mean I have to micromanage or control or or any of that be Mm -hmm. in people's face. What it means is if this culture isn't working, if this church body isn't functioning and I'm the shepherd, I am ridiculously in charge and I've got to do what leaders need to do. Mm -hmm. So you also say that you need to be hard on the issue, but soft on the person. Yeah. You know, there's a great theme throughout the scriptures, and you see a lot of different words, but my favorites are like grace and truth. Yeah, I like mercy too. (laughs) Mercy and righteousness. But you always see those two in parallel because that's the nature of God. He is a God who is for us and compassionate, but he's hard on the issue. You know, he has right ways and wrong ways of doing stuff. Where we mess up, in leadership, parenting, everything else is, we'll either be loving and not stand up for the real expectations of how things have to be done and hold people accountable, or we hold people accountable and we're not very loving, Mm -hmm. right? So we split it. God, God is together in that. And, and it's, it's, it's crazy in that when you start to look at the neuroscience, you would think that the person that designed the brain read the Bible. It just looks that way. I think he might that have. That was a joke. <laughs> I think <laughs> because, he might have. <laughs> because we're relationally wired, but we're also performance yes. wired. And the scriptures speak to that, and all of research validates it. And one of the things I love about all of your books and Boundaries for Leaders, the latest one is certainly like this. It is biblical, biblically principled in sure. everything yeah. that you share. And it's awesome. Whether you're a mom or a CEO, you need to read it. It's always great to have you it's here. You leave us with, with great things to think well, about. You do great stuff. Thank you. God bless you. By the way, available wherever books are sold. Pat? Fabulous, <clears throat> fabulous insight. I appreciate Henry Cloud, a tremendous guy. We leave you with today's Power Minute from Matthew 21, verse 22. Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Well, on tomorrow, meet a woman who was healed of multiple sclerosis in an instant. That's on tomorrow's 700 Club. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. This Easter, I got elected president of the chess club. A story of betrayal and forgiveness. (laughs) Quantum, (laughs) you know this chess nut? Um, Never seen her before. Those guys don't think the chess club is very cool. That makes it okay to pretend you don't know me? From Superbook, Peter's denial. I am ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. Join the Superbook DVD Club and get Superbook's newest episode, Peter's Denial, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of $25. And as a bonus, receive three copies of Superbook favorite, He is Risen, just for joining now. Do you love me more than these? You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. Join the Superbook DVD Club by April 30th and receive three copies of He is Risen as our way of saying thanks.